Sorry, I forgot to turn my mic on right there. So <laughs> got a little bit behind the eight ball. My name's Nathan. Thank y'all for being here. Um, I saw a lot of new faces. I didn't get to connect with a lot of you. So this right here is, uh, this is called a care card. Um, you may have heard me mention this a couple of Sundays uh, when I'm here. Um, but hey, listen, just, just fill that out um, and place it in one of the black boxes uh, as you leave. And either Ryan Sisney or myself, uh, the two elders here will reach out to you. Uh, maybe you're considering baptism. Uh, maybe you want to get involved in serving. Um, or maybe you're getting tired of doing life alone. Um, we learned last week uh, that doing life alone is deadly. Um, so maybe you just want to talk to a pastor. Um, just fill this out. And either, like I said, either Ryan or myself uh, will reach out to you uh, this week. This message is, is a little bit offensive. Um, so I'd like to pray that God would prepare our hearts to hear it. Um, because Jesus doesn't mince words. And so uh, let's, just, let's just pray. God, um, thank you for who you are. God, our, our faith should never be in what we think you can do for us. God, our faith should be in simply who you are and what you've already done. God, I, I just pray that you would use your word. Um, use this time uh, to, to pierce our hearts, God, uh, to, to teach us what our next move is as we keep following you, to, to recognize you for who you are, the God of the universe. You're before all things. You created all things. God, with the midst of your voice, a trillion, trillion, trillion stars and galaxies came into, into being. God, that's how powerful you are, but God, match to that is your grace and your mercy that you afforded us by sending your son to be tempted and tried in every way we were, to endure everything we could possibly endure, God, yet he did it perfectly. He never sinned. And he went to that cross and he became sin for us. God, if there's anyone that does not understand that truth, God, I pray your word will pierce their heart, will cut them to the heart. God, that your Holy Spirit would put a weight on them where they cannot even walk out of this room without talking to someone. God, you can do that. God, thank you for everything you're doing in and through Hendersonville Church. The, the ministry and, and the things that are going on here are just, are, are just incredible. Thank you for that. God, have your way. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this is the name of our series, The Real Jesus. We're going to really understand uh, the real Jesus uh, today. You see, there's no one more contested. There's no one that's more disputed. There's no one for which there has been more volumes of books written than Jesus Christ. Regardless, if you're here and you're a devoted Christ follower, or you're not sure about Jesus, or you think Jesus was just a good teacher, or you worship someone else, there's only three viewpoints we can have about Jesus, and they are mutually exclusive. But we're gonna learn all three of those. It doesn't matter who you are on this planet. There are only three ways you can view Jesus. And depending on your relationship with him, it is one of these three. And so no one really disputes that Jesus walked the earth. No, no one does. Everybody knows that, that Jesus walked this earth. And so beyond that, it's who is Jesus to you. So we're gonna look at verses 20 through really the end of, of Mark 3 today. Um, we're going to cover a lot of scripture today. And so I just, I just want us to jump right into to verse 20. It says, then he went home. This went home, the Greek there went to a house. Almost everybody is, is very certain he went to Peter and Andrew's house. Uh, we learned a couple of months ago that Peter and Andrew had a nice house. Uh, it had a courtyard in it. Um, and so people know that. That's where Jesus would go many times um, to, to be refreshed uh, was to Peter's house. But it says he went home. And the crowd, there's that crowd again. Are you in the crowd or are you a devoted follower of Jesus? And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind. So his family right now is in Nazareth, which is about 25 miles away from where Jesus is in Capernaum. But they're hearing about, about all this stuff. And, and so Jesus is there, the crowd's so massive, they cannot even perform the basic duties of life to eat. You see, the crowd didn't really care about Jesus. They didn't. They didn't care about him. 
They wanted something from him. They wanted his power. They wanted to be able to do something in the name of Jesus. That's what it was. That was what the crowd was. He couldn't even eat. Now, uh, when, the, when, when the news of everything Jesus had done had reached Nazareth, uh, Mary and his brothers were very, very concerned for Jesus' uh, basically his well being. I mean, given the conduct of the crowds, remember we learned last week how they were falling at him, possibly hurting him. Jesus was so concerned, he told his disciples to get a boat ready lest they crush me. And so that's what we learned about in student ministry today uh, that we talked about. What's remarkable is Jesus is God. Everything was created by him, for him, through him, for his glory. But remember Philippians 2, when we broke it down, the second week of the incarnate series, he submitted all that power to his father. Jesus came down here. He had no power. He was completely human, completely obeying the Father in heaven, and only the Holy Spirit was what moved through Jesus. We've got to make sure we get that. And so basically, the, the Mary and, her, and his brothers would have been concerned about him. I mean, he leaves house at 30. He probably would have had somewhat of a livelihood as a carpenter, and he just leaves. And they hear about these crowds and they hear about the religious elite and the Herodians having counsel to destroy him. What mom would not want to go rescue her son, even if he was 30, 31, 32 years old? They went out and to seize him, the Greek there is like to arrest him. It's used later on in the book of Mark when he was arrested. And so when John the Baptist, we'll learn about when he was arrested, same Greek word, his family intended to overpower him. And, and to get him. And so Mary obviously knew that Jesus was God because the angel told her. It's like, you know, you, you, this, he'll be called son of the most high when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But the problem is his brothers never believed in him until after his resurrection. I mean, even John, he says this, for not even his brothers believed in him. Uh, they thought he was out of his mind. They thought he was a lunatic. Now it's easy for us to judge his brothers, to say, well, how could they not believe him? How can they not believe him? Here's the thing, though. When you think about the disciples, we were talking about in the men's group on Thursday, and when someone brought it up, you know, Jesus might have told the winds to be quiet and the waves to be still and healed someone, and then walking from one town to another, tripped over a rock and face planted. He was completely human. Folks, he would have gotten sick. He was completely human. So imagine how the people are like, who is this man that tells the waves and winds to be quiet, but yet he, is, he has the same emotions and he's, a, he's the same human as, as we are. It's easy for us to judge. We've got, we've got this. We've got this right here. We know. Again, we fight from victory. We don't fight for victory. And so we, we know how the story ends. They didn't. So we got to be careful not to to, to judge uh, his brother. And here's the thing, other than the account of Jesus astonishing uh, the teachers at the temple when he's 12, we don't have an insight on his life. But he astonished the teachers. Mary and Joseph, uh, they, they go to Jerusalem for the Passover, like they do most, most times. And they, they leave in a big caravan and Jesus has stayed behind. And they're like, oh my goodness, our 12-year-old's gone. We've lost God. Where is he? I mean, imagine that. And so they return back. And so Jesus is teaching. And Mary, I mean, you can go back and read the account. She's like, why would you have your father and me in such agony? I mean, she gets on to him. Imagine how hard that would have been. Because he perfectly obeyed her. But they were scared out of their mind thinking they had lost him. And he, he, he explains to him, well, did you not know I must be about my father's house? And then listen what happened after that in Luke 2. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother, mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Huh. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Listen, folks, from the scriptures, Jesus learned. Again, it's, it's easy for us, uh, the evangelical Christians, knowing that Jesus is God, to not understand the importance that he was also completely man and had submitted every bit of his divine power and authority to his father in heaven to be used at his discretion. Jesus emptied himself of everything. And so it begs a little bit of grace to these, to these people who had a hard time understanding that he was the God 
of the universe. And we learn from scripture that Jesus had at least four half brothers and at least two half sisters. He obviously would have been the oldest. And so basically they would have seen so much. And, and before this, Luke 4, it tells us when Jesus comes back to Nazareth and he rebukes their neighbors so harshly, they try to kill him. Imagine his brothers and, and sisters seeing their 30 year old brother doing this. So they're, they're concerned for him. And even though his brothers didn't believe in him yet, post-resurrection, they sure would. James became the mighty apostle over the church in Jerusalem and wrote arguably the most challenging letter in the New Testament. Jude wrote an amazing letter. So these, these men, once they saw the resurrected Jesus, changed. But right now, they thought he was insane. They thought he was a lunatic. And so uh, basically that's the lunacy is kind of a charitable option for people in, in common day society to believe. Well, I think Jesus, I think he walked the earth. I think he was a kind man. I think he had some really cool wisdom uh, coming out, but I don't think he was God. I, I think honestly he was mistaken about himself and he might've had a little bit of a, of a madman syndrome. That's what I think about Jesus. That's kind of the more charitable view of Jesus. That's view number one. He's a lunatic. That's view number one. And so uh, basically uh, they thought he was out of his mind. Now here's the thing. If you follow Jesus, listen, huh, you're going to get told the same thing. I can't tell you how many people when we planned this church told me I was irresponsible, told me I was out of my mind, told me I was being a bad steward of God's stuff told me, a couple even said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And I can remember being up at night thinking I was losing my mind. And my wife's like, Nathan, what did God tell you to do? I said, he wants a church to be here at 1705 Spartanburg Highway. People will, will think you're a lunatic. I'll never forget one person I love to study. His name is William Borden. Um, and and there's a, there is a saying that, that was written in his Bible, uh, no regret, no retreat, no reserves. He was a multimillionaire uh, back in the early 1900s. He gave up all his wealth. He traveled to Egypt to learn Arabic so he could witness to Muslims. He got there and died after two months. Now, we're gonna find out, was, was he a lunatic for doing that? We're gonna look at that at the end of the service. Now, here's the thing. Jesus' family thought he was a lunatic. They're not the only ones that traveled to Capernaum to confront him. There's another group of people that traveled that thought something differently about Jesus. View number two. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, just so you know, that's in the active participle, so they were never stopping. That's important for this context. They never were stopping saying this. He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. So here's the thing. Ultimately, we learned last week, they wanted Jesus dead. Uh, the scribes and the Herodians, the, the nationalists, the political party that were loyal to Herod and consequently the Roman Empire, uh, they wanted Jesus dead for, for different reasons, but they wanted him dead. And so uh, basically they're, they're like, well, okay, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna kill him? He's starting to get a big following here. And so what they're doing here is they're trying to discredit him. Now it's necessary that we go to Matthew's account of this because it gives us further insight about why the scribes were contributing this uh, vocabulary to attribute to Jesus as basically being a liar. Then the demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? What they're talking about there is the messianic king, the Messiah that was prophesied about all through the Old Testament. They're like, can this be the Messiah? <clears throat> but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, Notice they, they didn't say he didn't do it. No one denies Jesus' miracles. No one's ever denied his miracles, period. It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Again, Jesus' healings were immediate, complete, and it was 100% restoration. If someone was, was lame, they walked. If someone was blind, they saw. If someone had a bleeding condition, it stopped. They were irrefutable and undeniable. You see, his, his biggest enemies didn't deny it. They literally just said, well, okay, uh, we're unable to, to deny his miracle, so let's discredit him. So what do they do? They, the Sanhedrin, most theologians believe the Sanhedrin, which, what's the Sanhedrin? Well, it's kind of the rulers 
of the religious elite was the Sanhedrin. They were at the temple. They kind of oversaw the proceedings at the temple. They sent basically a delegation down to Capernaum, 100 miles, by the way. Imagine them basically coming from Charlotte up to here to that kind of distance uh, to see Jesus. And so they're, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do uh, about this man that is gaining massive popularity because his massive popularity was a massive threat to their religious tradition. And they're like, man, what are we going to do? Now, here's the thing. They came with one intent, only one, to destroy him. They did not come uh, to, uh, to try to reason with him, to try to learn from him. Here's the thing. They possessed two qualities. They were ignorant and they were arrogant. When you're ignorant and you're arrogant, you're stupid. There's a big difference in being ignorant and knowing that you are ignorant. That's being ignorant. But when you're ignorant and you are arrogant to the point that you think you know, uh, I know stupid is a, is a bad word, but you're being stupid. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were ignorant of the works of Jesus, but they were so arrogant, they thought they had the answer. And they weren't going to listen to anybody else. It's a big problem we got in the church. Big problem. I know what's best. Really? Okay. Because unless it's a sin issue, it comes down to discernment, not deduction. But that's what these people were. Here's the thing. What a terrible accusation they are making against Jesus. They're saying he works for Satan. They're trying to position him as a representative of Satan to make him supremely evil so that they could turn the crowds against him. That's what they were trying to do. They're like, man, if we kill this dude right now, man, these people are going to be up in arms. He just healed tens of thousands of people. And I can, we can't refute it, but we're losing our status. We're losing our popularity. We're losing our ability to post on social media. Look what we're doing. They didn't have social media back then. Don't send me a care card. But, but that's, what they, that's what they were doing. They're like, oh my goodness, we're losing our fame. We are losing our status and our influence over this entire region. And so their arrogance kept them from seeing the evidence. They were adamant that he was possessed by Satan. They made Jesus out to be a liar. His family made him out to be a lunatic. The Pharisees made him be a liar. Those are two of the three views. There are only three views you can have about Jesus. There's not a fourth one. He's either a lunatic or he's a liar. Well, so what does Jesus do? Well, here's the thing. He begins by calmly talking with them. Now, keep in mind, they just said that everything he's doing is by the power of Satan. Is what they just said about the very son of God. I, I say that, I, I mean, I shudder to even repeat what the scripture says to say that Jesus was, was being used by the prince of demons. So what does Jesus do? He does something very revolutionary, something we rarely practice in the church. Look what he did. He called to them and said to them, wow, he goes to them in person. Man, isn't that cool? He didn't gossip. Wow. That's amazing. He goes to them in person. Isn't, isn't, that, uh, isn't that cool? That's neat. That's what we need to start doing. Yeah, that's what we need to start doing. Stop gossiping. Don't do it. He called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided, that's interesting. When you see the license tags on the cars, someone's got a Clemson and a Gamecock and it says house divided. That's, that's where this concept came from. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Here's what Jesus basically does. He takes, he goes to the scribes and he points out the logical absurdity of their statement. He's like, you're, you're absolutely absurd with what you're claiming. There's no way that if, if Satan's casting out demons, or he's destroying his own agents, then his kingdom is hopelessly divided. And Jesus' point is clear. Although the kingdom of darkness is chaotic, you know, a lot of people uh, see a lot of chaotic stuff, like chaos, and say, oh, well, that was the Holy Spirit. Well, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, just so you know. But Satan's kingdom is chaotic, but there's no way he is going to advocate for one demon to kill another demon. 
He's not going to do that. He's not going to deploy his agents to fight each other. And so that's where Jesus is helping him. Jesus only exposed, he confronted, he was against, and he cast out demons. He was set against. When he was on this planet, he was completely set against Satan's kingdom, the prince of the power of the air that we learn about in Paul's letter to the, to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, the prince of the power of the air. Make no mistake, this is, kingdoms, this is Satan's kingdom. This is his domain on earth, and he has whatever power God chooses to give him to reign over this earth for God's glory. Make no mistake about that. And so everything Jesus did was opposed to Satan. For the scribes to even make that claim was ridiculous. And Jesus just calmly and methodically points it out to him without even raising his voice, without doing anything. He is super calm and he just, he, he just literally uses fact. And here's what Jesus is saying. I'm not empowered by Satan. I have power over Satan. That's what Jesus is saying, and that's what his very next verse says. Look at Mark 3.27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Here's what Jesus is saying right there. He's basically saying, look, you can't come into a warrior's home and take his stuff until you first overpower and subdue the warrior, and then you take his stuff. And so basically in this analogy, the strong man is Satan, uh, and, and, and binding up the strong man is, is Satan there, and, and basically the, the world is his house, and the property are his demons and those poor souls that are possessed by demons. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And Jesus is like, this is what I'm doing. I'm just overpowering Satan as the Father wills. Jesus only did one thing only, will the Father. Only someone stronger than Satan can enter his domain, overpower him, and rescue his victims. That's, and that's what Jesus is saying. And the Pharisees made a huge mistake. And Jesus then goes into a verse that's highly disputed, that's, that's very misunderstood, because he makes the Pharisees aware that they are in danger of committing what has been properly known as the unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin. And so that's in, let's read the verse first in verse 328. Truly, truly, I say, or truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, again, back there, he's referring back to verse 22, he has an unclean spirit and they would not stop saying it. And so what does this mean? Even unchurched people, even those who are new to the faith and are relatively biblically illiterate have heard of the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin. And there's, there's a lot of confusion over it. And it's, it, let's note, first of all, what it's not. It's not murder. It's not slander. It's not uh, sexual uh, sin. It's not even genocide. It's not even taking the Lord's name in vain as vile a sin as that is, it's not that. It's, if someone is fearful that they've committed it, it's a good sign they probably aren't. And so it's simply the ongoing and continual rejection of the Holy Spirit's witness to who Jesus Christ is. It's the ongoing non-repentant rejection of who the Holy Spirit says Jesus Christ is. Well, Nathan, that sounds a little confusing. Well, it's necessary that we unpack this a little bit because it is a confusing verse. Last week, Jesus was grieved. What was he grieved at? It wasn't any particular sin of the Pharisees. It was their hardness of heart. That's what Jesus was grieved at, their hardness of heart. Their heart was hardened. And so what these Pharisees are entering into jeopardy of is this continuous hardness of heart, where they choose to call light darkness and darkness light. That's what they did with Jesus. And so it's clear that Jesus had a specific offense in mind when he talked about this. And in Matthew's parallel, it says this, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. You see how, listen, Jesus was never worried about his own rights and privileges. Folks, listen, the more we fight for our rights and our privileges, the less we look like Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I'm just being honest with you. I know no one likes to hear that. I don't like saying it, but it's biblical truth. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. Here's the thing. Jesus was perfectly obedient. He was perfectly submissive to the Father, and he was always perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Perfectly submissive to God. His, the Spirit was in control of every millisecond of Jesus' life. Well, Nathan, what do you mean by that? Well, look at his birth. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God, the Spirit. In his baptism, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. We saw what the massive Greek of that meant. And the Spirit descending on him, and it's like the Greek there is like he abode within him like a dove. Uh, his temptation, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Jesus' power of his ministry, look what it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and report about him went out through all the surrounding country. Do you, you see how the Spirit is controlling everything in Jesus' life? Jesus even saying his power. Listen what he says. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, it was never about the miracles. It was about what the miracles pointed to. Jesus Christ, the son of God. Even his death, how much more will the blood of Christ, who what? Through the eternal spirit offered himself. Everything Jesus did was through the Holy Spirit of God. Without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God and his resurrection <laughs> and was declared to be the son of God in power. According to what? According to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the spirit controlled every aspect of Jesus's life. That should be our goal. Our goal is to be perfectly submissive to the Father, obedient to his will, and perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit. That does not happen if we don't do the four things we talked about last week. Solitude with God, joyous prayer, in his word, and fellowshipping with the believers. It doesn't happen. Otherwise, you are gonna do things in your flesh or what the world says or what the enemy whispers in your ears. And here's the thing. Those who saw the overwhelming evidence of the Spirit's power yet remained unwilling to attribute it to God. And Jesus, as the Son of God, choose to attribute the, the Spirit's uh, power to Satan. Thus, they don't have forgiveness of sin because they refuse to believe where the power of God comes from. And that is why it's unforgivable, because they're unwilling to walk the path of forgiveness, which is repentance, to repent to turn away from your old life and start walking towards God. We talked about in our men's group. It is not the distance you are from God. It's not. Now, you don't understand how far I am from God. You don't understand what I've done. I don't care. It's the direction you're traveling. Are you traveling towards God? That's what repentance is. It is walking towards God. When you fall, we all fall. You will fall towards Jesus Christ and him crucified. But they assign the action of God to a demon and they refused. It's the conscious and deliberate rejection of the saving power and grace of God through Jesus. And that's what it is. And he says to the scribes, he doesn't tell them they're guilty of it. They're still breathing. Repentance is still there. He says, you're on the brink of it. So again, my question is, who is Jesus to you? Who is the real Jesus? At the face of every possible evidence, they refused to believe because that's why it's an eternal sin. There's no forgiveness if it's, if it's not possible to those who stopped rejecting the work of Christ. And so that's what we got to understand it. So any questions about that, fill out a care card or come talk to me after service. So Mary and her brothers, they finally get to Capernaum, okay? And, they, and they're outside a house and Mary's, Mary knows he's God, but her desire is likely to protect the son of God because she saw him grow up. She had to put... Uh, stuff on his boo-boos and stuff like that. So she's his mother. She's his mama. So she wants to protect her son. And they finally get to the house where he is. And listen what happens. And his mother and brothers came. And standing outside, they sent to him. 
and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Now imagine Capernaum. Imagine this. I mean, from the time where they dig a hole in a roof to lower a paralyzed individual down to Jesus. And the first thing Jesus says to him is your sins are forgiven. To when tens of thousands of people converge onto Jesus from up to 120 miles away, walk to him, carrying the sick, the lame, the blind, the demon possessed for him to heal them. Imagine the, the, the buzz that's going on in Capernaum and obviously his own mother and brothers could not get to him. And their hope probably was to be able to lure him away back to Nazareth to help him overcome his lunacy. That's what their objective was, was to get Jesus, all right, come on, let's get you back. And, and here's the thing. Basically, he, he solves this conundrum right here without shaming his family, but he turns from his blood family uh, to his, uh, his eternal family. And so look what he says. And he answered them, who are my mother and brothers? Now, here's the deal. This, this question is not of ignorance or it's not of disrespect. He clearly loved his family. One of the last things Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross was to tell his beloved apostle John to take care of his mom. Jesus adored his family. But, but why is he asking this? Who are my mother and brothers? I mean, people are probably like, what's he talking about? Here's what he's doing. He is simply using a real life interruption to teach a divine spiritual truth. And, you know, Mark already mentioned his family thought he was a lunatic. The Pharisees claimed him to be a liar. And listen what Jesus says. And looking about at those who sat around him, probably looking at the 12, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does what? The will of God. He is my brother and sister and mother. Here, here's the thing, folks. The test of a relationship with Jesus is obedience to the Father, is God's will. It's deeper than flesh and blood, a spiritual family which is characterized by a common bond, obedience to the Father. And Jesus didn't mince words about this. This isn't the only time he talks about it. Look what he says to his followers in Matthew. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. <laughs> and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, there's a, I guess you could call it a domestic idolatry. It's the whole, my four, no more. And what it means is, 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 a, is a husband, father of the household only cares about his wife and his kids. Now, let me be clear. Our mission statement sitting right there is love God, love others, make disciples. You love God first. There is not a close second. That determines everything, period. Everything flows from your love with God, your relationship with God. Okay, then love others. That begins with your spouse, if you have a spouse. If you have a kid, that's them with your kid. And then it's everything else. But here's the problem. They think that the earthly things for their kids is way more important than the kingdom of God. And so that's kind of the my four and no more uh, domestic idolatry where, oh, well, travel ball is way more important than being part of the family. Uh, you know, I, I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to provide this. I want to be able to do this. And so they just completely ne neglect building up the body, which is a clear command for anyone who is in Christ to build up and edify uh, the body. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear. It's not about works. It's your faith in Christ. And here's one way that people say it. Faith is the root, okay? Faith is the root that makes everything grow. Without the root, everything dies. That's the faith obedience is simply the flowers and the fruit. That's what obedience is. But everything is by faith. We obey not in order to become anything. We obey God because we have already become. That's why. It is not works that make you saved. It is faith, repentance, and faith in Christ alone that makes you a child of God. And so it, we must make up our minds, though, as to who Jesus is is if in Christ, if we are in Christ, we have the Spirit. We are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. No one or nothing can take that away from you. Period, end of story. Once you have repented and you have been converted to a child of God through Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit, you are sealed. And by having that, you have the ability to discern. And so the relationship precedes 
the obedience. The obedience is kind of the sequel to the original. And so there's no more important relationship than are you God's kid? And without the Holy Spirit, you're not. Paul's, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit, lowercase s, of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then he says this, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And I read this next part with reverence. I'm going to explain the Greek. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The way the Greek is there, somehow, and I say this with reverence, God the Father in his time that he put forth in eternity past, that was, uh, you know, Jesus, God the Son, and, and God the Holy Spirit all agreed to this. We're kind of, it's like we're on the same level as Christ in heaven. It's amazing how much God loves us, that we are fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. Ooh, I don't like that part. Yeah, no one does. I get that. That's our flesh. No one likes that. That's obeying God. That's doing the will. Jesus gives us beautiful, beautiful analogy on what the Spirit does in John 14, 15, and 16. If you want to know the purpose of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gives amazing clarity in those three chapters. Just in John 16, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Listen, folks, I hear a lot of things being attributed to the Holy Spirit of God. Here's a real quick litmus test. If it doesn't first glorify Jesus Christ and him crucified, it's not of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came with one purpose, to glorify Jesus, nobody else. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Spirit's role is to save, to seal, to guide, to convict us, and to point us to be more and more like Jesus Christ and him crucified. So to deny the spirit is to deny everything. And so that's what they truly recognize Jesus as Lord with an eagerness to obey the will of the Father. And, and that's what we, Jesus made this clear. Jesus is like, look, I'm God. I'm God. He even says this. If you love me, do you love Jesus? I mean, do you? Well, if you do, you'll keep his commandments. That's what, that's, that's what Jesus said. John, the apostle John the beloved that we know took care of Jesus' mom. Whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments is what? Pants on fire. Is a liar and the truth is not in him. And then again, a verse that we cover here every once in a while, Matthew 7. My opinion, scariest verse of scripture in all the Bible. This is Jesus talking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what? <laughs> How much clearer can it be? Listen, folks, it's incredibly simple. It's just not easy, but it's simple. Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, on that day, talking about judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Here's the thing. Jesus is either a lunatic or he's a liar or he's Lord. There's, there's not a fourth option. You either have to call Jesus Christ a liar or a lunatic or Lord. There's not a fourth one. There's not. And we're, we're going to learn that. Here's the thing. The earliest creed in the, in the church was three words. Jesus is Lord. You're like, well, Nathan, what's the big deal about that? Well, I'll tell you the big deal. Rome had passed a law that you had to say Caesar was Lord. And if you didn't, it was a capital offense. There's no telling how many Christians were, were, were killed and tortured because they wouldn't do that. They say, we have one Lord, and it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus is Lord. Now, 
our eternal destiny is determined by what we do with Jesus. It's, it's determined by what we do with Jesus to regard him as a lunatic or a liar and spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell or to say he is Lord and strive all the time to spend time alone with God, to be in his word, to have a joyful prayer life so that that leads to do his will. Listen, you won't do it perfectly. I, I don't do it perfectly. No one does it perfectly. But that should be our goal. We should have one goal in life, the will of the Father. That's it. Obey God, leave the consequences up to him. Some famous words from Charles Stanley. Obey God, leave the consequences up to him. If Christ, has, says, is, is, if Christ is who he says he is, the sanest thing we can do is the will of the Father. He calls us to total abandonment, total commitment. I want to imagine with me three people. One person is agnostic. They believe there's a God. Uh, they believe there's probably some sort of afterlife. They even believe that the afterlife might be some sort of reciprocation or, or retribution as to, as to how they live. But they don't live it out. They don't practice it. Uh, it makes no difference. Would that be sanity or insanity? Take the second person. Someone who is in a church seat two or three Sundays a month. Uh, that, they think that this is the word of God. They think it is. Uh, they think Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, they think prayer is communion with God, but they never pray. They believe self-denial and the will of the Father is the way to go, but always lives for himself or herself. Uh, they believe they're a pilgrim just passing through this world. This world's not their home. But, but, they, but they, only, they only live for themselves. Is that sanity or insanity? Now, I can quote Billy Graham and get away with it. I can't say it because y'all get mad at me. Billy Graham, 80% 80 of the people that come to church feel that way. And he questioned their salvation. I don't disagree with him. I agree with Spurgeon. He who does not long to know more of Christ knows nothing of him. Then imagine a third person that spends time with God, that prays, doesn't get it right, all the time, messes up. That's where grace comes in. And he lives out this right here. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Is God's law in your heart? Is this, is this pouring and washing over you? Is, is the Holy Spirit bringing it to mind when, when you mess up to convict you? He does me. I mean, two weeks ago, I repented. Because God made me aware of, of anger issues that I had. And he brought th these verses to my head uh, to, to, to convict me and to, and to sanctify me. Not because I'm anything special, but I am a child of God. I am a child of God. So when God sees me, he sees his righteousness. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And my faith is in that. I want to read something to you by a guy named Clive. His name is Clive Staples Lewis. He went by C.S. Lewis, arguably one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. He was an atheist, went to college, was set out to prove God wrong, that there was no God. And then he met the real Jesus, and he never looked back. And I just, just want to read this quote. It's from his book, Mere Christianity, which is a great uh, apologetic book. But I just want to read it. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really silly thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. I agree with that. If Jesus isn't the son of God, he is a lunatic or he is a liar if he is not the son of God. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. 
You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But don't let us come with anything patronizing, any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Folks, listen. There's only three ways to view Jesus Christ. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he is Lord and God. And there is not a fourth way. One easy litmus test, if you're God's kid, do you delight to do the will of the Father? That should be our goal. You're not gonna get it right. We're gonna mess up. But is that your delight? Do you delight in that? Because I can promise you, there will be joy and there will be peace. There will be a God gap. In other words, if God doesn't show up, you're gonna pay something. There will be a God gap because how else is God gonna get the glory for it if you do his will? Think about it. Who is Jesus to you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this text. I, you know, it's easy for us to, it's easy for us to criticize his brothers. But to see Jesus in his humanity which is a whole other set of blessings, God, that, that he can empathize with everything we're going through. He knows hurt. He knows pain. He knows it physically. He knows it emotionally. What, what, a, what a great peace that brings us. But God, <laughs> it's clear. Jesus is Lord. God, we need a group of followers here at Hendersonville Church that delights to spend time alone with you, that delights to have a joyful prayer life with you, that delights to get in your beautiful word, God, which is your revelation to us. It's the only revelation to us. It's your word. Those 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years with no contradiction in them. Not one. Holy Spirit wrote it through men for us to know more of you and to know your perfect will for our life, God. Not, not what's good, but what's best. God, you have a perfect plan for every brother and sister in here that's your kid. You have a perfect plan for them. God, let us not walk out of here Monday through Saturday acting like Jesus is a liar or a lunatic. God, let us walk out of here acting like he is Lord, Lord of all, the King of Kings, the Messiah that is coming back that we read about in Revelation 20 and 21 to set up his new beautiful kingdom, his new Jerusalem, the marriage supper of the Lamb. God, we are his bride, we're his body. God, thank you that Jesus was crystal clear on who he was. Thank you that he performed the, uh, the miracles to prove who he was. There's no question. Even the Pharisees, as much as they hated him, did not deny his miracles. They just said it was from Satan. God, please pierce our hearts that we would delight to do your will. And God, if there's someone here and, it's, and your word has opened their minds to say, man, oh man, maybe I have really acted like he's just a lunatic. I mean, I've not really said that, but, or that he was a liar. And if he's Lord, then at Matthew 7, is, it's real. He said it. I want to be God's kid. God, please let him fill out a care card or show up tomorrow night at prayer group at 5.30 or show up Thursday night or we have almost 80 people showing up, building each other up, which is a beautiful depiction of your body, the church. That is what we're supposed to do. God, thank you for what you're doing here and thank you for your word. Pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.